Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me speak two times in a day. That doesn't happen all the time. Um, okay, so this is uh, based on two papers that I've written in 2016 and last year on central bank digital currency with John Bardier, uh, my colleague, and Claire Noon, who is now at the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the usual uh, disclaimer applies. Okay, so... Contra uh, well, at least one on the panel uh, earlier mentioned that DLT may not be uh, such a critical feature, although what our technology people tell me that's actually very important, and that it was a, uh, in some sense, a watershed moment in the history uh, of uh, of e-moneys. I'm not a technical expert. I'm, an expert, I'm, just, I'm just taking that as a given. Uh, and w what uh, may now for the first time be technically feasible is, to, uh, is for central banks to offer universal access to their balance sheet. The point is that the existing RTGS systems are, are, were deemed to be not robust for universal access. You know, to give you an impression, in the UK case, the RTGS system has about 200 participating institutions. And you, when you're talking about universal access, you're talking about tens of millions of accounts. You're talking about not just one or two orders of magnitude. You're talking about several orders of magnitude more. And the system has to remain robust under those conditions. And the technical people say that it may be possible that uh, DLT uh, would uh, allow for that robustness uh, uh, to be there. Uh, I can't judge that. Uh, and I think the research is still ongoing. Uh, but my question here is uh, economics. Um, you know, it may, uh, many things may be technically feasible. That doesn't mean we don't we want to do them. Uh, and so here the question is: if it was technically feasible, would we want that? Uh, and for that purpose, I define a central bank digital currency as uh, access to the central bank's balance sheet, available 24/7, universal access. Although that doesn't have to be the case, but for this paper, it is the case. Electronic. Uh, national currency denominated, so with a one-to-one -one exchange rate to other forms of the national money, issued only through spending or against eligible assets, and in the particular implementation I show you, by buying back government debt, um, and interest bearing. And uh, the one-to-one -one exchange rate and interest bearing are in some sense linked because you, in order to maintain the exchange rate, you have to match supply and demand for that currency. Uh, and if you, um, if you over-issue, for example, if you over-issue a currency that has a 0% interest rate, then you get the classical textbook problem that that might give rise to inflation if the general price level is the only price level in the economy that can adjust. And that's, of course, the central banker's worst nightmare. However, if the interest rate paid on central bank digital currency is another price that can adjust, the price level doesn't have to do that work, and you don't get the inflation instability uh, potentially associated with this. And then you can actually use that interest rate on central bank digital currency as a second tool of monetary policy policy if you so choose. And of course, the critical point, uh, we think of this, uh, unlike Miguel Ordonez in his talk uh, this morning, as something that's coexisting with the existing banking system uh, rather than supplanting it entirely. Uh, so we, we based uh, our work on a model uh, that's based on Benes and Kumhoff and Jakob and Kumhoff. Um, and the monetary, uh, non-monetary model elements are standard for the models that central banks use. Uh, households, uh, I'm only mentioning the relevant aspects, uh, the households hold deposits that are created by banks in the same way as in this morning's paper, and CBDC created by the central bank. And then deposits and CBDC jointly generate liquidity for uh, as a medium of exchange, i.e. if people want to buy and sell stuff, they need to use some combination of CBDC uh, and bank deposits. Uh, then we have banks. Uh, we already talked about that. The government pursues fiscal policy, it pursues monetary policy in the same way that it pursues it today uh, for the risk-free interest rate, and then CBDC monetary policy, and what that means we'll have to talk about briefly. So monetary policy is uh, very, very uh, standard. It's a standard forward-looking Taylor rule for the interest rate on reserves. Uh, and that's identical to the current policy uh, uh, environment. So I'm building a policy environment here that has some new features, but it's not a completely new world. Right? Um, 
Then monetary policy, CBDC, and I'm trying to keep it deliberately non-technically. I don't put many equations, I don't, maybe none, uh, but, but there's, there, there are lots of equations behind this. But here's the logic. When you issue CBDC, you could either fix the quantity of CBDC and then let the interest rate clear the market. There's a market for reserves, right? Uh, or there's a market for CBDC here, and um, there's quantity on one axis and interest rate on the other. You have demand and supply. You can either fix one or the other, but not both. If you fix the quantity, the interest rate would clear the market, and you could have that interest. You could also have an interest rate rule that also countercyclically responds uh, to the business cycle. Right? The alternative is to not fix the quantity uh, of uh, CBDC, but instead to fix the interest rate and then let the quantity clear the market. Right? So then you say, I issue it at this interest rate, and if you're happy with that interest rate, you can get as much uh, from me as you want. Me and the central bank, uh, as long as you bring eligible assets, and we'll talk about that. And again, you can make that rule counter cyclical. And so then we simulate this model uh, to think about uh, the steady state's effects of a transition to CBDC. So basically, the thought experiment is we have a government that has 80% worth of GDP, of, of government debt outstanding, and then from one day to the next, overnight, just to keep it simple, to make it easy to understand, we're buying back 30% of GDP worth of government debt and giving those at a market clearing price, uh, giving those people who sell it to us CBDC uh, in exchange. Okay? And the results that we find is that this experiment in our model, which can be criticized, but you have to be rigorous. You know, we spend a lot of time on the model, a lot of time on the calibration. So it can be criticized, but only in a very systematic way. Where did we make some unrealistic assumptions in the model, right? So what we find is we found um, a positive output effect from a lower uh, real interest rate on the remaining government debt. Uh, we, uh, almost 2% uh, uh, steady state output increase. Uh, an off, uh, half, half of that is offset by a higher deposit rate relative to policy rate. So uh, the, the spread between deposit rates and policy rates compresses, and that's because when you issue CBDC, what you're doing is you're, you're issuing the mo a very liquid form of money, and uh, agents in the economy will tend to switch more to wholesale forms of holdings in the, in the remaining banking system, and that's on average a bit more expensive, uh, and therefore the banking system funding costs uh, is, is increasing. But the overall interest rate, of course, is still uh, in our simulation lower. Then you have, you have seniorage gains, uh, basically because of this interest saving, uh, and you can choose to deploy that to lower distortionary taxes, another output gain of 1%. And finally, you get closer to what is known among geeks in the monetary economics literature as the Friedman rule, uh, the, the point of uh, maximum money issuance where people are completely you know, happy with, uh, uh, you, you issue as much money as people could ever want. Um, and uh, uh, you get closer to that, you can never get all the way to it, because when you have private banks issuing all your money, then you basically have all the various frictions in the banking system, monopoly power regulation, blah, 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 uh, conspiring to keep a, a positive opportunity cost of holding money. You can never compress that to zero. But if you can produce some money using public uh, pr provision, uh, not debt-based, not based on the banking system, then that is uh, uh, cheaper and you can get closer to, uh, to this point of, of, of ideal money issues. You can never get there altogether, um, as I said. So uh, this is basically the, what I just explained to you in, in so many words. And here uh, is a, a simulation that we have in the paper on what would happen when you do this transition. On the horizontal axis, we have 60 quarters or 15 years. Because remember, this is a structural reform in some sense. What you would be doing here is you would literally uh, change a lot of prices permanently in the economy if you did this, including real interest rates, distortionary tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. And because there are some slow-moving variables like the capital stock in an economy like this, it wouldn't uh, be overnight that the economy uh, adjusts to this. So the operative thing that I circled here are the three factors that uh, make the economy basically lower cost. One is lower interest rate after an additional interval of uh, 
uh, initial interval of higher interest rate because initially there would be a boom here and by, by, by a standard Taylor rule you would respond to that by raising the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate but in the long run interest rate would also be lower. Uh, the fiscal tax rates would be lower because you're deploying the seigniorage that way. What I call the liquidity tax rates, which is sort of deviations from the Friedman rule, would be lower. Uh, and therefore, all of this stimulates the economy. You get GDP uh, jumping by uh, close to 1.5% on impact and by 3% in the very, very long run, driven by mostly a big uh, 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 jump uh, in, uh, in investment. Uh, but also an increase uh, in, in consumption. And so that's uh, steady state gains. That's sort of like, because this is, a, in many ways, it's a structural reform. Uh, but then let's talk about uh, countercyclical aspects of this. Uh, this is a simulation where you're actually now using the interest rate on CBDC as a countercyclical tool in addition to the Taylor rule. The Taylor rule here is set on autopilot. It does what it does. And we're trying to say what would be the incremental effects of also using the interest rate on central bank money, uh, which is lower. And so the shock that we're thinking through is a shock uh, of the Cristiano Moto Rostagno uh, paper. It's basically a risk shock where, all the, where uh, banks initially lend more for about three years, 12 quarters, because they're more optimistic, uh, uh, with reasons, about the state of their customers. Uh, the customers have become lower risk, and so they lend more, and this actually makes GDP go up. And then after three years, there's suddenly a reversal, and uh, every, everybody's risk suddenly increases a lot, there's a crash, it's a boom-bust cycle uh, in the economy. And what we're saying here is that, you know, that's, that, that's outside of what policy can do something about, a policy can try to smooth that out. Now, what policy would do uh, in a normal model is given by this solid line, this is uh, the, the policy rate. The nominal policy rate would, in an inflationary environment, uh, would be raised, and then when the economy starts to tank, it would be lowered in order to smooth the business cycle. It, this dotted line here is what the CBDC rate would do if it was kept at a constant spread relative to the policy rate, like two, two, two uh, percentage points or something. That's what it is here, uh, approximately. And now what we're saying is the countercyclical policy amounts to actually increasing the spread between the policy rate and the CBDC rate, uh, i.e. lowering the CBDC rate relative to the policy rate uh, in a boom and increasing it relative to the policy rate, not in absolute term, relative to the policy rate in a bust. And this is very intuitive. If you think about this, or you don't need to think about it, you can just look at this. This is the stock of CBDC uh, in, in issuance here. You're controlling an interest rate, therefore agents decide how much CBDC they want. Right, And then when in the boom you're, dis uh, you're lowering the interest rate, you're making it less attractive to hold CBDC, you're withdrawing it from circulation. People have less money in their digital wallets, they spend less money, this helps to cool down the economy a little bit. How much is a quantitative question? We get to that. And then in the, in the bust, you making it more attractive to hold CBDC, people get more into their digital wallets, hopefully spend a bit more, and this will help to stabilize the economy. And then here is what we got. Uh, this, the, the black line is, is the GDP again that we saw on the previous slide uh, without any countercyclical policy. And then the blue and then the red one is increasingly countercyclical policy where you're responding in this way. And what you see is, and, and, and in all three lines, the Taylor rule is doing exactly the same thing. It's set in exactly the same way. So the effects that you observe here are incremental. And what this shows you is that potentially, and you know, the details remain to be worked out. This is qualitative. Uh, incrementally, the CBDC interest rate can make an additional contribution to stabilizing uh, the business cycle. Now, the design principles for CBDC. Uh, this is something that, uh, from the paper uh, with Claire Noon, we, we basically uh, uh, argued why is financial stability not necessarily such a huge concern when you issue CBDC, if you do it right. And we said you need to pay an adjustable interest rate, 
no on-demand convertibility of reserves into CBDC, no on-demand convertibility of bank deposits into CBDC, and CBDC only issued against eligible securities. Pay attention to the second and the third one, especially the third one I'm going to spend some time on. It says no on-demand convertibility. That does not mean at all that you can't convert bank deposits into CBDC. Like, we can do this among each other if we choose to do so. The point here is, does the central bank guarantee that there will always be this convertibility come hell or high water, i.e. come a financial crisis? And we're saying that should not be the case. The central bank can even be involved and can convert it during normal times, but there's a circuit breaker during bad times when the central bank can just say, no, uh, this is not guaranteed, and at this point we're no longer converting. Because at that point of a crisis, the choice that you're facing is between uh, losing the convertibility and therefore potentially losing at par convertibility of CBDC into other forms of currency and a huge banking crisis. Because if you don't impose this constraint, then basically everybody, everybody in the economy can come to the central bank and say, accept my bank deposit in exchange for CBDC. And the central bank would have said one or two years ago, this is always going to be possible. And at that point, the central bank would then end up being a huge creditor to the banking system having basically taken over all those bank deposits, that's a guarantee of unlimited lender of last resort. And that, I think, is very, very dangerous. And we think that CBDC paying adjustable interest rate helps to not let, make this happen in the first place. I, for example, you could pay minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four percent. At some point, you would probably stop because that, that, that would be politically unacceptable, etc. Uh, Ulrich, Ulrich Binzahl from the ECB has made a proposal that essentially consists of a tiered interest rate system where you up to a cap you get a policy rate and once you hold more then you would, uh, you would get a very unattractive interest rate. Um, that's a variant on the first point, but we think that's not sufficient. It's also very, very complicated because then you have, for 60 million agents, you have to decide what, what their caps are going to be. Uh, it's, it, that, that, that's really a tricky uh, proposal. So we think we need the additional circuit breaker. And I'm basically going a little fast here because I'm being shown, somebody is waiting to show me the zero minute point, uh, sign. So I'm, I'm going to jump over all these because I, I just, uh, just explained them and I'm just going to conclude. So uh, uh, we, we found in our research uh, that CBDC has significant benefits, so that further research uh, uh, is, is, is worthwhile. Um, steady state efficiency, we found big state, steady state efficiency gains. That can be criticized. We find 3% if you calibrate the model differently, but then you have to tell us why I should, we should calibrate our model differently. Maybe it's only 2%, or it may also be 5 who knows. Uh, this is something that we need to think, but it, uh, we can think about this carefully in the model. Business cycle stability, we have a second policy instrument, improved ability to stabilize inflation in the business cycle. Financial stability should reduce many risks, but if it is not designed well, which is what that last part was about, then it may introduce others. We think that the run risk can mostly be eliminated by sound system design. And we think, like my co-author and I think, that offering CBDC as universal access to central bank reserves at the risk-free interest rate is not desirable. Because this would crowd out all. Out, this would really crowd out the banking system, in our view, and it would it would it would have the, many of these run risks that I, I think we should avoid. Because the maintained assumption here, of course, is that this system is designed in such a way that we want to maintain the integrity of the private banking system. That's a given, right? If you don't want that, then you basically are writing down a sabotage model, right? But that's not what I'm about, right? Um, and then uh, the critical issue, uh, and that has been stressed several times uh, this morning, is the design of a smooth transition. How do you get the plumbing right? How do you get the legal hardware, software, protocols and everything right? And of course, that's uh, where a lot of homework is happening at central banks right now. And I believe, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>